Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome to another AY program. This week, the Andrews, the Andrews Memorial Adventist Youth are partnering with the Education Department in honor of Education Week. We like to welcome all of you watching online. Thank you for being here, and please remember to share the link and subscribe. And for those in the sanctuary, it's wonderful to see you again. Let us start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us safely to the end of another Sabbath. Please be with us and watch over us. Please be with those who are on their way. I pray that this program blesses someone here today. Thank you for giving us the capacity to reason, to understand, and to all that you have provided us with. Please watch over us and be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we will have our AY ideals. The aim, the Advent message to all the world in my generation. The motto, for the love of Christ constrains me. Pledge, loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the youth ministry of the church, doing what I can to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. Now we'll have the song. Adventist youth are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth. Now we'll have special music brought to us from the August Town Basic School. John Dewey said, education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. And our theme for this evening is, education makes life beautiful. gives us the ability to express ourselves and understand our potential. Through it, we can make the most of the gifts and talents God has given each and every one of us. Education also gives us the opportunity to explore and, and expand our scopes. We're given the chance to experience new cultures, new people, and understand the, dis the indisputable fact that we are all children of God, created equal. Now this evening, we will hear from persons in different stages of their learning journey. New students, recent graduates, accomplished professionals, and educators themselves who are still being educated themselves. Our first speaker is a newly minted Doctor of Philosophy in Biochemistry, Brother Kenroy Wallace, who will share with us his testimony. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Pending, still pending, okay, it's still pending. <laughs> All right, um, so I was tasked to give a testimony on my journey through um, my postdoc, um, Doctor of Philosophy in Biochemistry. I will try and summarize it. It's a long journey, but I'll try to summarize it in a small introduction, give you a context. Um, three struggles and how the Lord delivered me through those struggles, and some extra blessings at the end. All right. So initially, when I started, I had just completed my BSc 
in biotechnology. Now, biotechnology is a field that focuses heavily on application. So, following my undergraduate research, which I excelled at, I fell in love with the idea of creating something new or the whole protocols and methodologies of research. So I approached my supervisor at the time and I told her what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to create something that would contribute to science, not just arbitrary science, but something that I could do to contribute to science. Now, at, the, at that time, she, was, she had done a lot of research surrounding diabetes, but I wasn't interested in diabetes. I wanted to do something different. And so she said she wanted to start looking at cancer work or anti-cancer studies. And I was excited. So she said I could come on board um, with a proposal that will help me progress through my research with, that, that surrounds the topic of um, developing anti-cancer compounds. So initially, she had a colleague that was interested in creating small molecules. We call them small molecules in chemistry, right? And they're usually of two or three compartments to the molecule. So when I was in undergrad, I kind of ran away from chemistry. I wasn't excited in doing chemistry because it was a very difficult, there were very, there were very difficult courses. But for some reason, I felt that I was, I, I got confident enough to take on this challenge, chemistry at a postgraduate level. So we approached her colleague and he decided to take me on in the initial stages of my MPhil, because that's what I did, the MPhil slash PhD program. So we started and he gave me um, a challenge that he was having. He was trying to create a small molecule that he was unable to purify. So with the assistance of two brilliant, brilliant professors there, um, I was able to complete the task that he was having trouble with. So we were, able to come, we were able to synthesize something brand new, a novel compound that was never been synthesized before. Right? And we characterized it, et cetera. About two years or three years after that, we were able to create at least three or three more, so a total of four novel compounds. Now, the first struggle, this is the first struggle. Remember, I initially said I wanted to work on cancer studies, right? At that time, the university didn't have much resources around cancer studies. We weren't sure as to where we would be able to do the cancer research. But one evening, I think one evening, um, um, a, a professor by the name of Dr. Gray had reached out to my supervisor that he wanted to do a presentation um, on his research, and he studied the effect of busy, the busy nut that we call, that we use for seasoning, etc. the effect of busy nut on, prost on prostate and um, breast cancer cells. So after his presentation, I approached him, I talk, talk, spoke to him about the interest I had in working with um, anti-cancer compounds and assessing my novel compounds on the, on the effect they have on cancer cells. And he was excited and he wanted me to come to his lab and conduct the research. So right there, the first struggle that we had was finding a place and where to do anti-cancer research. And the Lord kind of just directed me straight to someone who was willing to have me in his lab and was willing to teach me and train me on, on the protocols and methodologies in assessing um, cancer cells at the in vitro level and even at the in vivo level. So once we had made that arrangement, he spoke to my supervisor and they together formed this, um, they had an MO, MOU and have this program where he would train two of the postgrads in his lab and they would be a part of this collaboration program between the University of the West Indies and his university in Southern in Baton Rouge, uh, Southern University, Baton Rouge, right? So to travel to his university, I had to fund myself. So the first thing we did, we applied for grants, but I was only awarded about $3,000 in grant to kind of take care of me for an entire year. Now, if you guys do accounts, right, to have the rent to pay for rent and the food and transportation, like, that amount of money, probably about $550 on average a, a month, right? On $3,000, man, that would last for at least half a year, right? So the second struggle that we had is financing. How was I going to be able to finance myself for the entire year that I was there, for the first year that I was there? Now, when we had decided to leave, 
unfortunately, they had had a flood in the area, right? So a lot of houses were damaged, unfortunately. However, on the flip side of that, because of the damages, persons were kind of renovating their houses and they were going, they were throwing out furnitures, old furnitures, etc. So what we did initially was that to furnish a small apartment that he had gotten for us, um, he found some, I guess, brand new second hands, so you'll put it that way, as furniture for the apartment, which was, I guess, offset some of the costs, because he didn't have to pay for those, you just collect them from the persons who were donating them. Secondly, he had offered to pay for at least two months' rent for us. So if you do the math, so kind of almost fitting there in the, in the $3,000 that I had. Now, when we, well, not when we got there, before we got there, we had met a member, well, an old member of this church. Um, he used to attend Andrews in the 1950s. Yes, he's a, he's a big man, right? And he was, he's a kind, he has his wife, is the kindest set of people I ever met in my entire life. Right, so he, he said to us that if there were, because there's two of us at the time, he said to us, if there's anything that we need, we just have to ask him, all right? He was willing to carry us to school because he worked at the school as well, and he was on his way. So he was willing to pick us up, so we didn't have to pay, we didn't have to pay for transportation at all. He was able to pick us up and take us back home um, at, at 8 o'clock in the morning and at 5 o'clock in the evening, all right? Also, there were days that he would buy us lunch um, if we didn't tell him, if we had to tell him not to buy us lunch, to put it that way, right? Because he was always willing to help us. And after, eventually I went to his church there and we formed a relationship, but we leave that for the end. Um, yes, also, when we also got to the school, we met another Jamaican and she was an undergraduate, brilliant young lady. And even she would aid us in lunch if we needed it, right? So right then and there, we were able to kind of fit the accounts to make it work. Right, so the Lord delivered, well, provided persons in our lives to help us deal with the financial burden of traveling to the United States for an extended period of time without no income, per se. Um, That's the second struggle. Now, the third struggle. The third struggle had to deal with time. Now, after the first year, I came back home, and the whole transition, I was able to convert my master's into a PhD program. So I changed my registration from master's to a PhD. And then we had to travel back to the United States to finish the PhD part of the research. All right, so when, when I got back there, my supervisor, at this time I was a seasoned senior postgraduate, so he didn't need much, I didn't need much supervision at the time, because at this point I, was, I had mastered all the methodologies and of all the equipment in the lab, etc. I was able to conduct my research with minimum supervision. Now, he decided to go on sabbatical to Jamaica in this period, so I was there in the lab, kind of alone, because I was the only postgrad at the time, and he had left a proxy supervisor in, for document sake, so to ensure that I was legally there and I had a proper supervisor um, there at the institution. So carrying out my research, et cetera, um, the, the, the professors in his department apparently did not, they had some issues with him. And while I was there, they were trying to kick him out of the department while he was not there, right? So as a result of that, I kind of got the blunt end of the stick in a sense because they tried to lock me out of the lab a couple of times well. But I had, I had a key, right? And I had a key for everywhere in the department actually. So when they tried to lock me out of the different labs for me to do my research, I would just, open, I would look at them and go in and still do my research. So that kind of infuriated them. So they told the, they told the chief of the department what was happening. Um, she came and she put a sign on the door about um, no one is allowed inside and so on. So, so I told him and he said he will, he will get it sorted out, right? Um, like a couple of days passed, because remember time, I'm here for X amount of time, I have to get X amount of work done. A couple of days passed, nothing really changed. So I decided that I, I was going to get my research done regardless. So what I started doing, I went to school at like 5 p.m. in the evening, and I stayed till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. So I worked at night. So when everybody was leaving, I was coming to, I was coming to school. And I, I did that for a time until he was able to kind of sort out the issues that he was having in the department. So thank God for allowing me to be safe because I was on the campus by myself at midnight, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, 
doing, doing work. And on Sundays as well. Only day I wasn't on campus was on Sabbath. All right, so the next thing now, when I was there, um, there was an experiment that I had to do. It's called Western blood. It's about assessing proteins in a cell to ensure that the proteins are being expressed or not expressed when exposed to a stimuli. Right, so that whole technique I kind of taught myself, and it's a three-day experiment. Now, the experiment has various parts, and they have some very delicate apparatus that aren't so replaceable in, in a quick order, in, in short order. So I am ensured that I had all the, the apparatus and all the necessary agents ready. However, for a section of, section of the experiment, I only had like two pairs of specific size glassware. Now, when I was doing the experiments repeatedly, unfortunately, I broke a few of the delicate glassware, and I had no replacement. So I was frustrated. Um, I asked one of the other grad students whose boss did not like my boss, right? But she knew the struggle, so she would kind of sneak out some of the apparatus to lend me to do my research. So that's how I kind of got around that aspect for a, for a time. Then I broke that glassware that she lent me. So now I was out of options. So I, I, can't, I was convinced that I was out of options. So I was furious. I was furious. And like I left the, the left that day, and I went to the bathroom, and I washed my face, and I was like, what am I going to do now? But when I came back to the lab, I don't know what happened, but I saw the glassware that I broke, unbroken, on the table. Like, I don't know what happened, but I, I'm the only one in the lab, okay? And I'm the only one that have access to the lab. So when I saw that, I, I was like, all right, look at God. Look at God, right? So I just continued, and I was extra careful. <laughs> This time, right? So I was able to get through all those experiments um, that I had to do. And on additional note, um, when I was there, my boss told me that he had a lot of reagents in the storage, in the deep freeze. And if I wanted to do any additional experiment, I had to find them myself. So there were days I would take up the inventory book and I would go through for hours trying to find anything that I can do to add to the body of my research. And of course, I found a few things and I asked a few of the colleagues there and they were willing and able to um, assist me with some of the, the, the equipment that they had. And all in all, we kind of got, I got through all I needed to get through within the space time, with the time that I had there. Like my boss, when he saw me, he, saw, he said I was working like a madman <laughs> because I would, call, I would go to campus early in the morning, like about seven o'clock. Dr. Henry, he would carry me to school. And he would take me home at about five, and I, was, I would eat some dinner and get a little rest. And I'll go back to campus at 8 p.m., and I'll spend another five hours there, and I'll come back home. So that was like my average day, right? except for the days I went to the gym, because I had to go to the gym. It was my stress relief. Right? So um, after, those, after all those um, struggles, so time, God allowed me to, gave me the energy and the endurance to get through all I needed to get through within the short period of time that I had. All right, so that's the third struggle. Now for the additional blessings, because I'm, I'm out of time. Additional blessings. So when I was there, I made a few friends. Um, I made a, a friend from, she, she, she was from Trinidad, and she was at the premier university in the time, and she was willing to help me with some of the experiments that I could not afford, because she could have access to them, so she was me, there to help me. I also met some friends from Kenya, from church, Brazilians, um, Argentinians, Africans, and together we did a lot of outreach programs, and it's like that whole experience kind of brought us closer to God because we were able to speak to people who were struggling, and it was, it was a, I guess, a growing experience in Christ for me because, I, I mean, we made friends. I started a choir there at one point, <laughs> and we, we together, we, we, talk, we spoke to old people, we spoke to, spoke to persons who were drug addicts, and we were able to get people to come to church more, more young people. And it was all that experience, a blessing. So in all in all, God helped me with my education, right? But he also helped me to grow spiritually through the experiences I garnered while I was studying away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Kenroy. Our next speaker will be Elder Leighton White, owner of White House Architecture, showing us how 
how education is beautiful through his designs and how he has helped his church in remarkable ways. But before that, we will have an instrumental brought to us by Brother Theodore Henry. Amen. That's one of my mentees, Theodore Henry from the Charlotte Today State Church. Thank you so much for joining us, Theo. So, I was in grade three at primary school. I won't even tell you what year that was. A long time ago. And I had a teacher who I adored. Her name was Mrs. White, ironically spelled with an I, and she was someone who I adored thoroughly. And one day, similar to this week, when it was career day, she brought in her son, and her son spoke about architecture. And I was blown away as to the profession of architecture and what it entails based on what he said. And ever since, Ever since, from grade three, my aim in life was to become an architect. So when I went to grade four, at the time it was common entrance. They had a special group of students who they accelerated because typically common entrance is in grade five and six. But because of our 
aptitude they allowed a few of us to do the common entrance in grade four and I was successful and went straight on to high school at grade 10. At age 10, sorry, right. And ever since, even in high school, my, my choices in terms of subjects were all leaning towards um, architecture. There was a choice that we had to make between geography and French. And I don't know why the administration did that to us as students. Because I loved geography and I loved the French, but I had to choose only one. And certainly I chose geography because I felt it was closer to architecture. And the French teacher took me aside and walked me around the campus explaining why I need to do a second language, right? I said, yes, but I really need to do geography because I wanted to be an architect. So fast forward to uh, past the high school stage, past the university stage. I was now at the end of my university studies. And at that point, the next step for me to do was to do internship for a few years with an architect and then uh, take the exams towards being registered as an architect. And at that point, I was already fully engaged at church because the discussion here is how do we transition this information into our church life. And would you believe that at my early stages in my development, I was able to assist with the upgrading or the development for Whitehall SDA. Uh, some of you may remember Whitehall was in a very small rickety building uh, with zinc, zinc roof and timber uh, structure with a paved floor. And they, it could hold maybe 50 persons. And they were burst at the seams and they needed to have a larger, uh, more permanent structure. And so I was asked to assist and they, did the drawings and they were approved by the parish council and they started construction. They're still in construction to this day, but they, it, it was something that I was proud of that they could have allowed me at a, as a youngster to design the church for them. And even after that, I was able to join the building committee for my home church and I assisted with many development plans for that church as well. So before I got to registration, interestingly, the president for the association at the time, he was adamant that everybody must do the exams on Saturdays. And interestingly, he had Adventist background, or Adventist family, rather, who regularly attends church. So you would think that he would know better. But he insisted that regardless of whatever plea I come up with, I should just conform and do the exams on Saturday. He even said to me that, what makes you so special? We have many Adventists that come through here and do the exams on Saturdays. The exam is at nine o'clock in the morning. You can do it during your divine service and you can go anywhere in the evening. No, that blew me away because I, I couldn't fathom doing an exam on Saturday when that is never a part of my, my religion and my practice and so on. So I found my place in a circle of professionals who were insisting that I break the Sabbath and do this exam. And even when I went to ask them on various occasions, wrote letters, you name it, to see how we can make some adjustments, they eventually said, all right, you know what? You can do the exam, say, Friday afternoon, and then we will lock you up in a room for the entire Saturday uh, so that you won't be able to correspond with anybody else to give them answers for the exam. I prayed, and I prayed, and the Lord gave the answer, and they eventually rescinded and said, no, they're not doing it. And I certainly said, I won't be doing that either because I don't see the value in doing that. I even spoke to our religious liberty um, team at the conference, and they wrote to 
the association and they eventually agreed but because they were literally feeling that they were being strong armed by our lawyers and so on they decided that they will give me the response like a day before when the exam should have been in that year so i missed that that exam and had to sit out an entire year before i was able to sit the registration exam and up to this day there, there are people in the association who remembers Leighton white for this experience and and know the registration for architects the exams are now set on a monday and not on a saturday so the, the course of history was changed because of our efforts and our prayers and the work of our liber religious liberty folk at the conference so having gone through these experiences having sat through many uh, meetings and committee uh, efforts to my home church and other organizations i've now been asked to sit at a conference on their conference wide development committee and prior to that i was on the phillips field development committee what you're seeing on the screen is a synopsis of the concept design for the phillips field project it's called camp phillips field retreat and retreat oasis and adventure park now, if you're not aware of what I'm speaking of, in St. Thomas, there's a huge plot of land that is owned by our conference. And on that plot of land, it was agreed that we would do a camp on that ground that will house our young people and our various organizations across our church. So we visited the site, we, we looked at it. it. It was very hilly in some areas, flat in some areas. But once you get to the top of it, the views are phenomenal across St. Thomas and into the Caribbean Sea. So when I looked at the topographical surveys and looked at the requests from the, from the conference, we came up with this design for just a small part of the site. And I'll just run through it very quickly with you. You'll see it's not very clear on the screen there now, but you see some, some yellow, some orange buildings, and those buildings are the, the main uh, spaces that you will be gathering. So the next slide, as you see, the Pinnacle Chapel is on the highest point of one of the ridges. And what was being planned for this space is whenever you have a camp, or any other larger events, this would be the spot where you'd have the worship sessions and it would be able to view the entire property as well as the surrounding St. Thomas areas. The next slide will show you now the prayer garden which is right in front of this chapel. And in this prayer garden, as the name suggests, it is so designed that it is apt to, for you to sit there and reflect and pray. And the next slide will show you the uh, auditorium where it would have been a multi-purpose space so that if we have a convention of some sort, you can certainly have it at Phillips Field as opposed to at Kencott where it typically is or renting another space here in Kingston. So St. Thomas would be the, the hub for the entire conference and this would be one of the main auditoriums that would be housed there. The next slide will show you the meeting hall where we will have several meeting facilities in one cluster, and we'll be able to have the highest technology there so that we can do the business of our church. The next slide will show you a health spa uh, fitness center where if it is that you have persons with special needs or you yourself need to have workouts and so on, you can actually go there, retreat with a group of people, and there's a gym and a facility for health that you can um, take care of your health needs. The next slide shows a sports field, and certainly with any camping activity, you would need to have a large field where you can have many games and so on. And that would have been at the lowest point, the, the, the flattest point of the site, where you can house a football field and other fields as well. Next slide has the rock garden, where or you can call it a rock, rock amphitheater, where it would be 
along the natural slope of the hill, we are carving steps or seats where you can naturally sit and watch a concert or some event uh, entertainment-wise or just listen to the word in the open air. Next slide, we have the trail right around the site. There's an orange line that shows you that you can jog or walk and have adventure going along that trail, whether for young or older children, etc. Um, that was designed to follow the natural trail around the topography. Next slide shows the camping cabins. There are about three different types, and the idea is that depending on whether you're having pathfinders, adventurers, um, couples retreat, and so on, these cabins would facilitate the housing of the various groups. Next slide will have the uh, holiday cottages. So the idea is that you can book the, the space and use it for the housing of any group or type you can consider. And even yourself, if you just want to get away for a weekend, these holiday cabins would be for your use. The pool and clubhouse is uh, also a concept where once you're on that pool with an infinity edge, you can look right across to the Caribbean Sea, as well as across St. Thomas, and you can be rejuvenated and relaxed for a weekend, for a week, you name it, the facilities will be available for you. And then there is uh, open camping. So there are spaces where we've designed for you to put um, tents, and then you can have real, real camping without any of the real amenities around you. You set up your shop right there using your tents, etc. And then we have farming. Now, as a church, we believe in taking care of ourselves. We believe in setting up food that can take care of us in times of hardship. And so Phillips Field does have a lot of land that can allow us to teach persons to farm. And also the produce can be sold in the community or used throughout our various churches. Then we also have sustainability. This here is showing the parking where it is not just asphalt, but it's on areas that you can have the soil percolating, the rain, rainwater, and so on. The idea is that the entire facility will be sustainable. So you can certainly use it with solar power, um, water retention, and so on, so that we can touch the earth lightly. So with the, and I just went through very quickly, with the experience and knowledge that I gained through school, through mentorship, through my various ups and downs in architecture, I was able to, and still continue to share within our church, from the conference level, even here at Andrews, my home church and other churches, so that the work can finish in our aspect of the vineyard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother White. Our third presenter is Dr. Sherard Little, our adventure director here at Andrews and a cardiothoracic surgeon. He views the beauty of life not only through and biology of the human heart, but also through photography, uh, he, captures or he captures nature in wonderful images. I hope that he shares some of, some of them with us today. Please welcome Dr. Shard Little. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, so, how many of you have to... Clicker, do I need it? Or can I just ask him to... You will advance for me? Yeah, okay. So how many of you have to do um, continuous education as part of your profession? Okay. Next question. How many of you enjoy doing continuous education? One person. <laughs> so I have to do it as part of my profession, but I don't really enjoy it. If I don't do it at the end of the year, I won't be registered the next year, and I can't practice. Now, after completing my formal studies, um, I decided to do something new. I had always enjoyed photography. And, uh, you know, as a child, I was always around cameras. My father had a camera. 
I always use it, that kind of stuff. But I decided that I wanted some formal training in photography. So in about 2015, I decided to enroll in a course at Edna Manley School for the Visual and Performing Arts. And that has changed my life. I've gone through several courses there and other places. And now I have been doing courses online as well. Now, I say this to say to you that we should always be learning, OK? Wherever you are in life, you should always be learning. And you may have your formal profession, but there may be something else out there that you may want to engage in. Maybe cooking or sewing or pottery or whatever you name it. There are so many things out there that we can engage in and that can enrich our lives. And there are so many, so many resources available to us now online that, you know, the, the, um, the possibilities are really endless. Now, in terms of photography, I love photography, all kinds of photography. I like monochrome photography, which means black and white images. And so I'm going to share some of my images with you this evening in the few minutes that I have left. And I see Hugh here. Hi, Hugh. Great. So I start with this image because this image was actually captured with a film camera. Anybody still uses a film camera? Probably not. <laughs> what is that? Because everybody is using digital now and using their phones. So this was captured with a camera which is about 40 years old. And this was along the Negril Beach. Came up to this tree early one morning, not many people on the beach. Um, this bird was just sitting there on the tree. And I thought it would make a nice picture. But I was going in the wrong direction. I was facing the wrong direction. And I was very fearful that in walking past the tree, the bird would have flown away. So I sneaked past the bird, went around, framed it, and this was the image captured on a film camera. Now, almost each and every one of us has a camera probably in your pocket right now, okay? You can do wonderful things with your phone. There are apps that you can unlock the power of the camera in your phone, apps that you can um, can edit your pictures on your phone. So everyone can be a photographer and can be a good photographer if you invest the time in learning how to use your camera or your phone. Next image, please. This is another image which was taken um, by Kingston Harbor, and again, with a film camera. Next image. Uh, anyone knows where this is? This is a common site. This is a waterfront, of course. And early one morning, the guys are out fishing, and I captured this image. Next image, please. So this image was captured at dusk, um, and this was at Rocky Point. Anyone has ever been to Rocky Point? You know where Rocky Point is? Yes, OK, we know where Rocky Point is. It's a common place for fishermen. Can you go back? Yeah, so um, there are these boys sitting in a boat at dusk. Um, doing some hand fishing. And I was there, I was there actually to capture the night sky, but I saw these boys and I said, you know what, let me get this image. Okay, next image, please. Okay, anybody knows where this is? Chevron, you're not supposed to answer. Anyone? No, Mrs. Little, don't answer either. What did you say? It's in the Blue Mountain region, but it's not Blue Mountain. It has a particular name. And this, is a, this tree stands out. This is a Sincona Botanical Garden. OK? So when you go, you can go either Mavis Bank and go past Clydesdale and um, up to Sincona. So early in the 1900s, this was a very important place because important trees were grown here. Some of these trees had um, pharmaceuticals that could help with the treatment of TB and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of rough to get here. Um, you're either going to hike or drive in a 4x4, four four, but um, it's well worth going. When I captured this image, I had gotten there just before dusk. The fog was coming in. I saw the tree. I saw the chair. 
and I want you to capture this image. Next one, please. Okay, anybody knows where this is? It's Portland. We're in Portland. <laughs> Portland is a big place. Turtle Bay? Exactly. So this is, tur you call it Turtle Crawl Bay, okay. I call it Turtle Bay. I don't know which is the correct one. So, again, this is a place I love to go and photograph. My family likes staying here as well. I went out early in the morning to capture, you know, these um, rock formations in the water. And while I was setting up my camera, there were people coming onto the beach, middle-aged, old people, and they were coming to get their exercise in and to get their morning dip, to start their morning. So you can see to the left of the image two, um, the impression of two persons out there in the water. They were just reflecting. And, you know, when I retire, this is the kind of life I want to have, you know, just go run on the beach and go take a morning dip and then start my, start my morning. Next image. This is the same place. This was um, in the daytime. Next image, please. Okay. New Parish. Where is this? It is St. Thomas, but where in St. Thomas is this? Reggae Falls. So Hillside, Reggae Falls. And this used to be an old hydroelectric plant, which was decommissioned. And a lot of Jamaicans like to go there. Okay. Next image. You might not be able to figure out where this is. It's a beach. This is actually <laughs> it is a beach with a fishing boat. <laughs> so this is actually Lime Key. Um, a lot of Jamaicans like Lime Key as well. This was actually a drone image. So I do a bit of drone photography as well. So not only using my DSLR, but I do a bit of drone photography. Um, so this was one of these drone images. Next image, please. Okay. I tell you, I like black and white, right? I like the textures um, of black and white. And this is, this is actually an image I captured in Treasure Beach, uh, St. Elizabeth. Just seeing this tree there, the twisting of the roots, um, the texture of the rocks that it's coming out of, and this was a final image. I, like, I entitled this image, Twisted. Next one. Okay, everybody knows where this is probably. <laughs> down by the, um, it's down by Kingston Harbor where you have the, um, what do you call that place again? Wharf, yes, wharf. Okay, next image. Um, we can do creative things with photography as well. So this was actually Buff Bay, um, in Buff Bay, and there are, there's a rock beach there, and my wife likes to go out and collect rocks for the garden. So while she was collecting rocks, I was stacking rocks with my camera. And this is the final image. Okay, next one. Um, this was St. Mary on the way to uh, Robins Bay. Some Sabbaths, we just drive out to St. Mary um, and walk along the beach. So we were exploring the beach, and I came across this what I would think is a river that just hasn't quite reached the, the water yet. It's maybe about 50, 50 meters away from the water's edge. And there was this fallen tree there. And this was an image that I captured with some weather coming in. So you can see the sky is a little dark and, and looks a little menacing. But I like this image as well. Next one. This is St. Thomas. Um, this is the Yalas Pond. We drive past the Alice Pond all the time when we're going to St. Thomas. But this time I decided to stop early one morning. And I actually had gone out to get some drone images, and my drone just would not take off. There was a software, um, some software problem. But I had my other camera with me. I had my long lens. And I just saw these birds, some of them perched on these long poles in the water. And I just loved the reflection of the poles in the water and just the birds sitting there as if in anticipation or waiting for something. Next image. Uh, this was um, one day when Siobhan and I were rafting on the Rio Grande. We were coming down from, um, name of the place now, um, Berrydale. So we traveled down from Berrydale down to the water. This is about seven miles. 
And we saw this calf just, you know, drinking from, drinking from the water, you know. Um, looks so serene and placid. So I captured this one here. And Siobhan likes this one. Next image. This was um, Yalas Pond again. Um, I saw this tree and a reflection in the water. And there was a lone bird sitting in the tree. So um, I had actually left my camera on a tripod. And uh, I was going back to the tripod to capture the shot. And the bird flew out to the tree, went along the water's edge. I'm like, why this bird won't spoil my picture now? So I walked back to the bird, OK, and kind of shoot him from the water's edge. And he flew back into the tree. And then I ran back to my camera and captured this one. OK, next image. Can you tell who this is? Any ideas? Looks like our AY director. <laughs> so this is a technique which, um, which I learned and I love to use. It's called double or multiple exposure, where you take several pictures and you can stack them in the camera itself, OK? And sometimes you can get wonderful results. So there's a picture of the sky, and this was stacked against um, a picture of, of her head and face. And you can see almost like the clouds coming out of her hair and that kind of stuff. I love this image as well. Next one. You know these two. They're always frolicking. They always love water. Um, this was at um, Reggae Falls as well. Next image. Um, this was an image that I captured when I went um, on a trip to Bali. There are lots of rice fields. Rice is a very common um, staple that is grown there. And there was. I had come out early one morning as one, on one side of the road, just looking for pictures. And I saw this guy, old guy, walking along the road. And then he kind of took off his slippers, and then he went into the field on the other side of the road. Now, this is a busy coastal road, um, traffic going along. I'm like, I have to capture this image. And unfortunately, I only had one lens with me. It was a 24 to 70, so not a very long lens. So I really had to get close to him. So I'm like trying to negotiate crossing the road. And then when I crossed the road, I just had a very little time to just cap snap him walking into his field going to work. Next one. Um, this was a guy who I met um, coming from his fields in Sincona. And the other part of that Sincona story was that when I drove my car up there, uh, Forrester at the time, as soon as I got to Sincona Gardens, I was within the gardens itself. I was driving along a very rough road. My tire burst. I'm like, oh, God, I'm here. Why is this happening to me now? And this kind guy assisted me in changing my tire. I'm grateful to him. And then afterwards, I asked him, can I take your image? He kindly consented, and this was his image. Next one. Um, this is waterfront again. This was taken in film, OK? And it's not like these digital cameras where you press the shutter, you're da 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 I had one chance to capture this image. So I framed it. Um, and then I asked the guys to run up and jump. And this is the image that we captured here. Next one. Uh, St. Thomas Fishermen. Um, this is Kobe Beach. They are pulling in their, um, pulling in their nets. Next one. Um, again, Portland. Um, I had gone to Berrydale again. And I saw these guys coming to me with this cow. And they were crossing the river. And I said, you know, I have to capture this one. And as they came closer, got in range, got it. And then when they came up to me, I asked them, is it OK if I took your image? They were OK with it. And this was the result. Next one. Um, cricket, lovely cricket. My wife had gone to a funeral in, uh, was St. James or Trelawney? St. James. So while she was during the, at the church service, I had my camera. And there was a little primary school close by. And these little boys were outside playing cricket. And I just had to go onto the field 
and uh, capture some of the images. So love this one as well. Next image. A friend of mine wanted to do a photo shoot. Um, we went to the um, train station in Bogwalk, and um, this was the result. Next one. This was Islington, St. Mary. I went to go to Tacky Falls. There was no water at the falls. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So you make a, take advantage of whatever is available to you. Saw this farmer going out to his farm. Um, I asked him if I could take his picture. He said yes. I ran up the road and captured him, pull, pushing his bicycle and his produce up the hill. Next one. Port Royal, old guy, he's out fishing early in the morning. Ask his permission, he was good, and captured his image. Um, do a bit of architecture as well. You know where this is, anybody? It is a Spanish town old iron bridge, famous bridge. Um, this was a drone image because it's kind of hard to climb down to the edge of the water. Can be done. Did it once, but wasn't doing it this time. Um, and uh, captured this image of an iconic structure in Spanish town. Next one. Anyone knows where this is? Where? No, not Sagaville. So, um, as a pathfinder, in my earlier days, we used to do lots of hiking in the Clydesdale region. And this was an old um, water mill of the coffee plantation there. So this is actually Clydesdale. And you have this um, old coffee mill with a water wheel there. Clydesdale, I think, is still St. Andrew, probably, isn't it? Yes, it's still St. Andrew, thanks. Next image. And this is just a close-up of, of that water wheel. Next one. Anyone can tell where this is? Yes, it is Folly, the old Folly ruins, and that has a story all of its own. Um, and this was another drone image. And you see a little island in the background there. This is Folly again. OK, architecture, yes. Um, I wanted something different, so borrowed my mother's old rocking chair, transported it to Folly, put it on the front porch, and that's the old rocking chair at Folly. Next image. Um, this is the last image. Um, I put this here because I want to indicate that you can do photography anywhere. It had just rained. I just went into my backyard. This was a banana leaf. And I captured this image. So you don't have to go any place weird or wonderful, travel the world. Um, you can do your photography wherever you want. Next image. Next one. If you want to see some of my images, it's my website. I'm on IG. Next image. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Little. There really is beauty in the simple things. Our next speakers are Dr. Dr. Zand Zandre Mohansing and Vara Marie Mohansing, an attorney at law who will share how their educational journey brought them a beautiful marriage and so much more. Um, but it's Education Day, and we wanted to talk a little bit about why education is so beautiful. It is beautiful indeed, and... Almost as beautiful as her, but you know. It's in public. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, so we wanted to talk a little bit about why education is beautiful. Tell you a little bit about our experience um, with education and some of the lessons that we've learned mm -hmm. coming up through the formal and informal uh -huh. education systems. All right, so a little backstory. Um, we've been to school for a while. <laughs> we've been through a lot of school. We actually met in high school. And the Glenmere High School located in Clarendon. <laughs> Clarendon's finest, if I may say so myself. <laughs> and then we moved on to UE afterwards. Yeah, so we met in, in, in high school and that's kind of where we got together. And um, we never really matured into you know, the robust relationship that we have until university. So I'm very, very thankful that both of us decided to go, um, to go on to tertiary level education and certainly at the same institution so that we were able to, you know, progress in that department. Yeah, for sure. And education continues to be beautiful because even though we went to a secular university, we were very active in Advent Fellowship and it was through Advent Fellowship that our faith was, was like strengthened and when our when our beliefs were challenged and when we were kind of thrown in Babylon, yeah. it is through education that we met up with Advil friends who helped us throughout this journey. And when, when I tell you guys that these are friends who, uh, priceless, lifelong friends that we met through education. <laughs> yeah. And, and also a big part of it, as you're talking about Advil, is that this community of friends also helped to educate us about things that are not, you know, your traditional. standard, traditional kind yeah. of things. So, I guess that's a nice segue into what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a doctor and Zara is an attorney at law. And we'll tell you a little bit more about <coughs> the nuances here <laughs> and there. But, <coughs> but generally, you know, that's, that's our, our, our substantive occupation. Um, That's what we put on the type on the paper then. The yeah. House. And it's like, oh, occupation. Right. And that's, I guess that's what we went to school for. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, but there are other little areas that formal education would have fallen short in taking care of. Mm -hmm. Personal development, for example, um, personal finance relationships there's no there's no class actually there is a class named philosophy of sex and love yeah but that's not but that's not, that's not that's not even in our faculties <laughs> you know um but, but we don't go to school to learn about that but a place like Adfil yes. gave us that gave us that opportunity sometimes it was just talking underneath <clears throat> the tree after church it was just the Adfil after visit visits that we got but whatever it was it was it was good education or sometimes it's somebody that would bring a book to you yeah gift it to you like <laughs> we have a friend who walked around and gave everybody um Daring this, to ask the for same more. copy of you know of, of gave everybody their own copy of the same book yeah and then people would recommend good books to us so where did we know that we're supposed to go read five love languages we learned that through, through Advil. Advil and, and that's know, education. friends that we had there See, and education is beautiful beautiful mm -hmm. and that's self-education you know mm -hmm. that kind of opened up the idea of going to read for something more than just school yeah. because there are so many different aspects to one's personal development external to your your, your purely academic education, but all of these are, in my estimation, equally important. I definitely agree. Yeah. Um, that said, though, if we can talk a little bit about what formal education did for us. Okay. Well, personally, formal education, I think, will, will always kind of reign supreme because it gives you something substantial to always have under wraps so you know how sometimes we always say if worse comes to worse you always have that degree you can open a practice you can start a business and it gives you something to to hold on to you're an expert at something you're, expert at you're something. an expert at something formal education for me also helps me help me to understand a lot of the academic nuances different opinions um different researches that you you won't really get unless you study them or or unless you're forced to study them because you have an exam to pass <laughs> and, and somebody a gentleman who is a um captain john was once again well he was a, a a military officer and one of the things that he he taught me 
is that a lot of people will look at your resume and see that you have a university degree yep. that has nothing to do with the area that they want yep. to hire you. But they'll hire you nevertheless because it means, it means that you're teachable. teachable. I know that one. I yeah, know that it one. means that you're teachable. We never practice this so, <laughs> <laughs> so the truth is that sometimes you have to learn how to learn. Yeah. And that's why first year of university is such a steep learning curve because you really just don't know how to learn just yet, how mm -hmm. to teach yourself or how to learn from the people who are teaching you. And formal education does that for you. It makes yes, it a lot easier. That's true. Um, and it gives you a good network. It gives you a Listen, such a good network. Don't play that. Formal education for me has been the, like, the best networking opportunity nowadays. I go, like, I don't know where I can go where I don't remember somebody from school. I say, remember? Yeah. We used to run around Ring Road. You don't remember me? And yeah. they're like, yes, man. So that really helps to broaden your network. And even and even in the professional sense, it's yes. it's very useful. Cause I was at work today and I went to the pharmacy to um to, to get some meds for my patient. And then the young lady in the pharmacy goes, "Oh, Zodra, it's you. How are you doing?" <laughs> and to be honest with you, I really never remember her. But, but then she was just like, "Remember, we were we were on the same building. We did the same program. Well, we did different programs in the same faculty." And I'm just like, "Well, yeah, I think we probably did." But I don't quite <laughs> well, remember your face. And, and then, you know, it just brought us to a place where, let's just say, it ended with me getting the meds for the patient and all went well. And you have a link now. And we have a link. <laughs> I can put the phone and call somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not saying mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't build these bonds external to formal education, but we're talking about the benefits of it, and certainly that's one. Okay, you know, when you struggle together on hall, yeah, man. It's, it's, a a different different bond. Bond. Yeah, it's a different bond. It's a different bond. And I will always love formal education for that. The, the different... And study like I don't miss studying for an exam, but studying for an exam really teaches you endurance yeah. and it teaches you a lot of life skills like don't give up on them things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. And also to, to state the obvious, formal education it's gives like you a little bit more security. Yes, for than, sure. In terms of financial security, mm -hmm. um, well, economic stability. And and I and I say that tongue in cheek because depending on the, the the particular area that you pursue, you may not pursue a professional education, mm -hmm. meaning you may not um, pursue a professional degree, so it may be harder for you to, to, to land a job, but nevertheless, it makes you still a little bit more competitive. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly a lot more competent if you decide to go and start your own business in a certain field. Um, it really does help when you have a, a depth of knowledge mm -hmm. that you can bring something additional to the marketplace. Right. Or if just... you want to be an asset to somebody else's business. Or know. if you want to be an asset to yeah. somebody else's business, certainly, certainly. All right, so those are some, some benefits there. Um, there's one more thing that I think we should, we should touch on though, because okay. we've spoken a little bit about the formal education. But in terms of informal education and how that is important and quite beautiful too, um, I told you that well, I think maybe Zara was the one that, that said that she's a, she's a lawyer. That's, that's what she does. That's her substantive occupation. She's going to school for it. But that's what she went to school <laughs> for. Um, she's but, practicing. And she practices it to a certain extent, <laughs> you know. Um, but then she also practices as a, as a social media... I'm an entrepreneur, okay? She, yeah, I'm a social yeah. media strategist, and I specialize in law firms. And it's interesting because when I started that, when I started just learning about stuff like that, it was, it was kind of already even wasting your time. Learning about content creation through ministry, through, you know, kind of dabbling with Instagram and YouTube and stuff like that. And then figuring out how to work analytics, figuring out and then using the legal knowledge that I have to pair it with this knowledge about marketing that I literally sat down and watched courses and taught myself. It kind of, it just helped to, to develop a whole niche and created an opportunity for me that nobody could ever tell me that this was something that was possible. And that's the power of these vocational areas and the power mm -hmm. of going out and going after these non-traditional areas that sometimes you might not see as important. Yeah. And, and it also allows you to bring your passion to life yes. and make something useful and beautiful out of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a school of thought that suggests that nothing is really new, it's just that you have new combinations of things. There we go. So for example, to use um, your situation, see, 
um, you're a liar. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what you know. Lies what you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you love social media, and yeah. you always loved social media. Mm -hmm. So why not learn about social media mm -hmm. and then pair the knowledge of social media with, with your knowledge, knowledge of law and mm -hmm. create a business that does social media management for lawyers like you know it makes it makes sense when you think about it in that linear um kind of kind of approach see education is beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and, and on that note you know as we get ready ready to wrap up there's a certain depth of reasoning that um you're able to 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 engage in when your brain is consistently not necessarily incessantly but consistently pushed you know, mm -hmm. and, and one of the best ways to ensure that you stretch your brain, stretch your reasoning ability, ensure that you're always challenging your mind is through consistent learning. Yeah. And, and, and if you decide to go on academic route, then there's no way of going on academic <laughs> route without consistent, consistent learning. learning. Facts, you know? big facts. So, so it really does help in, in that department. Mm -hmm. It does help in that department. That said, um, we've, we've covered quite a few benefits and shared a little mm -hmm. bit about how education has helped us, you know, professionally. Um, before you go, I wanted to ask you, how do you think, like, how I approach education was different from how you approach education and what can we leave for the persons watching? Okay. Because I think we approach we took two school. Two very different approaches, actually. Different approach to school in general. Yeah. So. so okay. So, so I always knew that I wanted to be a surgeon. Well, always, meaning since I, I was leaving high school. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. I'm still not there yet. I'm still an intern. Um, but I knew that's the direction that I want to go. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's a competitive space. But those who do well... AKA, he's a nerd, okay, guys? He's always studying. Um, but Zondre did that for the first, maybe. So, so I invested that first year of med school. Maybe the first three years, two to three years. Actually, the depth of studying that I did in the first year was yeah. never replicated. Okay. So I That's invested fair. that first year to build a really solid foundation, mm -hmm. which then boosted my confidence as a, as a medical student and also kind of buttressed my knowledge base. Ah. And then second year and third year, because I had systems in place that allowed me to study efficiently, like I literally went and learned how to study properly. I learned all the different techniques, Feynman, Feynman, Feynman uh, technique, uh, and uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 there, there, there are a number of different techniques, you know, to uh, how to make sure that you learn properly. So. <laughs> um, Pomodoro is a good one, make sure you know that one. But anyway, the point is I went and I learned how to learn, <laughs> and I invested that first year into, into doing it very well. And second and third year, they were hard and, you know, it took a lot of effort and energy. But then by third year, you know, this studying thing had gotten quite, I don't want to say easy, because it was never really easy. It was easy. It for wasn't you. as hard as it is for a lot of people yeah. who never invested the time to create systems that teach them consistently and allow them to learn properly. And by the time I reached fourth and final year, he just cruised it, through. You know, it really was he not that hard to be While honest. me, on the other end, I was struggling. Your girl was struggling. Your girl was studying every day. <laughs> Especially when I started law school, I was studying every day. And then Zondre was like, oh, I'm going for a hike. So our, our journeys are a little bit yeah. different. Um, I also tapped a lot into the create, my creative side. <laughs> Yeah, we, are, we apologize. Sorry for the bike in the background. Yeah. The editor can edit out that part here, maybe. If not, that's fine. Yeah. Anyways, so so we I took a different approach because I'm not a genius, so I had to study really hard. And um, I also tapped a lot into the creative side of things. So I was very, we were both very active in Adfil, and we were doing that along the way, but also understanding where your strengths and weaknesses were, knowing yeah, what you definitely. needed to put. Understand your strengths yeah, and your weaknesses. Knowing where to put energy and stuff like that. Like yeah. I remember my first, I remember being a good student when I was in first year. I know stories. And I remember the, the, the tutor, he looked at me, he's like, this is a beautiful piece, but it is way too creative for a lawyer. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. And it was in that moment I started blogging because I was like, well, the creativity has to go somewhere. Yeah. And I mean, where it has brought me now, it's, it's, it's kind of... 
kind of surreal. And, and there's a pearl in that that I don't want us to miss. Yeah. The idea of knowing your strengths and weaknesses, mm. and contrary to popular belief, do not go trying necessarily to strengthen your, your weaknesses. weaknesses. And let me tell you what I mean. You have strengths for a reason. Develop them. Use them. Make them the strongest you possibly can. Because I believe in being well-rounded. Don't get me wrong. I believe in being well-rounded. But I also believe that you can't be an expert at everything. Pack. So choose the few things that are worth investing your time in and become the best at those. Because it's better to be a, a, a genius at a handful of things than to be a novice at a million. That's true. Because at the end of the day, general knowledge never really made nobody successful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, general knowledge, general knowledge is cheap. Anybody can have that. Yeah, you can but the depth of knowledge that you have in a particular area... Mm -hmm. And your ability to deliver, to deliver concrete results there will land you in a much better place and allow you to, to see your dreams come to life um, a lot more and a lot better than, than if you try going to dabbling everything. Yeah. Yeah. Good gem, good gem. Yeah. Well, everyone, education is beautiful. It is. <laughs> it really is. Thanks for listening to us. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Happy Bye. summer. Bye. Thank you, Mohan Sings. Now we'll be, I'll be interviewing a sister in our church who we haven't seen in a long while, Sister Shari Phipps, who's a deck officer. And I want you to share with us, Shari, what, what exactly is it and where did you study? I studied maritime engineering, focusing on nautical navigation. I studied in University of Maritime in Panama. Ah. Could you give us a brief description of that job? Well, in short, as best as possible, it's mostly focused on managing and operating a vessel. But this has various sectors. I focus on navigation, but there's also firefighting, protecting the cargo, the crew, and the environment. So we also have to study maritime law, we have to do economics, and we also have to be well-versed in security duties. That's quite a lot. Did you know Spanish before you started studying in Panama? No, I, I knew nothing in Spanish, strange enough. I did it in high school for one year, and just like anybody thinking that Spanish is not their favorite subject. It was not mine at all. And moving to Panama, which is mainly a Spanish-speaking country, there was a lot to adapt to. And it was certainly a readjustment, mainly because in English, the adjective and nouns, they're in a different placement in Spanish. So having heard English all of my life for 18 years, and then being almost dropped in the middle of the deep into Spanish, right into the university, it was definitely God's doing for me to be here today. Do you speak English now? Sí, puedo hablar español. Muy bien. Perfect. So your field of study is known to be male-dominated. How important is it for you as a female to keep motivated to perform efficiently? That's a brilliant question, Kayla. Motivation in my field is something that had to be intrinsic but believe it or not i was never always a motivated student in my household i have two parents who are both teachers so there's a lot of structure and as a toddler i didn't like structure i didn't want to be in a place at a time it was annoying but then they started to do something teachers do which is a rewarding system and they told me sherry if you do well in class, you will get, and at that time I wanted treats. I wanted a Burger King or a KFC. I, I, at that age, that's what I wanted. So they started to use that system, and growing up, they started to change. Of course, you're, you're dynamic, right? So they said, okay, if you get this grade, you will see something else or enjoy a different trip. For me, though, I always thought that motivation, especially with so many males, I saw that as from prep school, 
I enjoyed the company of the males. They didn't annoy me or give me any trouble. And their conversation was something that was enlightening because it made me reflect on what myself as a female, how I think, how I do, and that made me want to improve. Because you are in your circle as females, and yes, they will speak away, they will do a certain thing, but you don't hear the other side. So that, for me, motivated me to say, oh, I like what I do in engineering. I like the math. I like the geography. I had a struggle, actually, with math, believe it or not. Yes, I was never an A student in prep school. Even in high school, my teachers told me, leave the math alone. Put it aside. Do anything you want, but don't take the math. Don't take physics. And strange enough, God is willing, and, and with so much consistency and discipline, I was able to not only pass math in high school, I did it again in Cape. I only got one though, but God is good. I was able to still move on in university where I only got A's in math. Beautiful. Have you had the opportunity to work on board a ship? What was it like? Yes, I've had the opportunity to work twice during COVID. Um, on two international voyages, I went from Saudi Arabia to China on one, on the first one, and on the second one, I went to Quebec to Texas. So a job like yours, you've been stationed in many different countries. Can we hear one of your favorite experiences and why? The best experience I had was in Saudi Arabia. And... Um, it really had to do with the persons, more so the people, the pilots that came on board. They had an instruction where the main thing of every crew member is to hide their religious liberty, books, anything that was spiritual. And that to me felt like I was hiding myself. I was hiding who I was. I had to hide my Bible. I had to hide anything that had Cristo, Jesus, Jesus, whichever language. It had to be hidden. And that said to me, maybe there needs to be much more in the maritime industry as it relates to Christianity or religion. Because if they have to hide it in a port, that means we can't show who we are. We're hiding our true reflection of what, we, what we're passionate about, what we as Christians even like to do, which is to be believers of God. So it was a reflective moment when my captain had to say, Cherie, please hide everything and continue working as normal. So I couldn't read the Bible for about a week. I know that devotion is very important to you, so that must have been quite hard. Many persons find it hard to be gone from home as long a time as you've been. What encourages you to keep going? Wow, that is actually a question that I think from childhood, I, record, I remember Nautilus, the Pathfinder Club here, we would go on camps, and I'm an only child. So if, you, if you, parents are here who are saying uh, they can't leave their child for a week, my mom, from a very early age, had that in her to say, you need to go to camp. So being left alone, at, it was probably six or seven, being left alone for a week, I had to do with what was there. I had to do with, work with what was present. And you know, sometimes at camp, sometimes the water isn't probably running. The food that you're eating is not the same as you use at home. And it's, it's a whole adjustment, readjustment. So for me, it was since that age of going to Nautilus Club, doing different camping activities, it slowly started to become a part of me where I didn't need to be at my wonderful home of abode to enjoy Anything that I wanted to do, if it was work, or in my case, work, <laughs> you know, it's really, and uh, something that I always remember is that my mom used to say, when you feel alone, you're not alone. And trust me, you will feel alone on the ships because there's no family members. And I mean, the Wi-Fi is not always as consistent. I will get to talk to my mom probably once a month, sometimes on a voice call, and texting would be frequent, but voice calls, video calls, you can dream about it. So during COVID, most of us had that indoor time off and it felt a bit hard to readjust. I thought that was good enough for me to go on the ship. Believe it or not, brethren, no, it wasn't. 
Because here it is now, there are different languages of, my, of the crewmates. There's different food. Most of them don't even believe in God. So there's nothing that's of commonality that you can find with those on, on the ships. You have to create something new. You have to bring your passions to them and they will bring it to you. So being able to adapt, that would be God. Amen. What would your message be to others pursuing difficult goals and non-traditional careers? In short, go for it. <laughs> I will look at how in officer training, they tell you about how to make a route. And there are four steps. It's top, the first one is appraisal, where you have to gather everything. If, whether you're going, for example, let's say we're traveling from here to China. Do we know the port in China? Do we know the weather tides? Do we know what will be the difference in drafts? So certain little things you have to start gathering to be able to state, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. Next to appraisal is planning. Planning now puts it in order. What you need to start doing, what you don't need to start doing immediately, and vice versa. After planning is execution. Now this one is difficult, even for me still. Execution is something that you have to be consistent about. Discipline yourself to state, okay, I have to do A, B, C today. Not tomorrow, not next week, that will be too late. In fact, it should have been yesterday. So today is even late. And the final step is what they consider monitoring. Monitoring is just as important as the first three. Because monitoring is where you can shift and adjust and make the difference changes that you need to do. So when there's something difficult in your life, these four, four steps or four methods are useful because now you're able to break down what you thought was impossible to do and difficult to do and time consuming to do into a very easy to do list. You know, people like to do list one, two, three. Here you go, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry, for coming and presenting to us. May God bless you on your next journey. You too, Kayla. Life is beautiful with education. Our next interview will be with Brother Nikain Bent, who is a first year student at the University of Technology. Hi, Kayla. Nikain, your last major exam was Cape, correct? Yes, it is. Did you feel prepared going into the exams? Yes, I was very prepared because I surrounded, my fr I surrounded myself with friends who would motivate me, persons who I could say, hey, I don't understand this. Can you show me step by step how it's done? And they were there for me. So I would say I was well prepared to go ahead and do my Cape exams. You got sixth place in Jamaica in the subject of information technology. Were those at all the results, kind of results that you expected? Well, to be honest, no. But I wanted to prove my, my IT teacher wrong. She was like, um, IT is a very hard subject to get one in, and you guys have to step up. And I was like, all right, miss. I'm going to show you how easy it is. And I went there, and I made sure I studied my friends. Went in the exam knowing most of the stuff, yes, almost everything I knew on the exam. And surprisingly, when I saw the results, I didn't even know I came sixth. My friend showed me and said, Nikain, look, you come sixth in Jamaica. And I was like, really? Really? And they said, yes, man. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's good, that's good. I have to go show mommy. I showed my, my supporters and they were very proud of me. So I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't expect it at all. But I did my best, you know. Here's a church saying amen, amen. So how, was, how did you adjust to the shift from being a True Blue student at JC to university? Well, to be honest, it wasn't hard. Because from the first year of sixth form, I'm all in lower six, it has taught me a lot of self-teaching. And that is what you do mostly at universities. You have to teach yourself. The lecturers just come out and give you a whole topic, and you have to go home and do your own investigation, have to do your own research. And for me, 
it wasn't hard. So adjusting kind of sitting well there. But as you go along, you have to learn more and adapt to the environment of the university and so forth. Um, you were awarded a, burs a bursary scholarship by the education department. How were you introduced to this scholarship? Well, I was introduced to this scholarship um, by Sister Query. Um, Sister Joyce Query. She has been my spiritual and academic motivator since day one in growing up. And she was like, hey, Nikane, why you don't try out this bursary um, scholarship? And I was like, thinking about it, I was like, you know, I, I should try it because I've been working hard. And I said, all right, let me just give this a shot. So I, I did. I joined and I applied for it. And I just pray and wait for um, a call from um, the church. And I did got it. I did happy with it. <laughs> Amen for Sister Curry. Yes, indeed. Apart from UTEC, what other schools did you apply to? Was it your first choice? Well, yes, it was my first choice. It was, it was the school that was most recommended to me for persons in my field of study in architecture. I would usually go on sites, you know, nearby sites, and I'll be like, I, I want to become an architect. And they're like, yes, the engineers on the site or the construction um, the site manager would be like, yes, you take it to the right place to go, and so forth. But apart from UTEC, I wanted to apply. If I didn't get through with UTEC, I said I would try Excel Community College. If not, I would try VDT as a draftsman, as a um, draftsman, and then climb my way up to the architecture if things didn't work out. But everything worked out in God's favor, and I'm at UTEC now. Amen. Now that you're coming to the end of your first year at School of Architecture, what new projects and plans do you have your eyes on? Well, right now, I don't really have a project right now, but I plan to teach myself to be more prepared for second year coming up. I want to get to a state where I can correct my lecture if they make a mistake. Yes, I want to go and make a stand. I want to be prepared for that. So uh, I will just use my summer period, learn, learn more about architecture, um, go on much sites as I can, and just be prepared. Maybe you can get Elder White to help you out with that. What would your message be to others coming out of high school and thinking what to do next? Well, for high school, high school is the foundation of a career path. And every student should plan what they want to do before they leave high school. You have to be prepared for everything in life. So my message to them is, before you reach upper school, know your career path. Be prepared. You don't want to, when you're leaving high school, you have to do over subjects to do a career path that you didn't plan to do. So my message to you is be prepared, know your career path, so when you're leaving high school, you know exactly where you can go with your subjects and so forth. Thank you so much, Nikain, for talking with me today. You're welcome. Our next and last interview is with Sister Claudia Henry, an educator. Hi, Sister Henry. Good afternoon. May I ask, what, sub, what age group do you teach? I teach across the sectors, from primary to postgrad. Is there any subjects that you specialize in? I specialize in language and communication across the board. That would be things like public speaking, that would be things like report writing, that would be things like just uh, business writing, minutes, etc. Very fitting for the former communication director. <laughs> yes. At what age did you first realize you wanted to be an educator? You know, Kayla, uh, I realized that very early in life because my mother had eight children, I'm the first. 
And she gave each one of us a profession and she gave me teaching and <laughs> I seem to have just fallen in love with it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I uh, went to high school, for example, and at high school, you're supposed to spend five years, you know, before you get to A-level. So there's no A-level at Oberlin. So I did my CXCs, my subjects in four years and used one year to start uh, an advanced level program there and then went on to college. And when I went on to college, I liked it. And, but I had to stay a longer time than I should because I'd gone in too early. So I, I did well and I was student of the year and uh, they suggested that I should do law. And I in fact got a law scholarship but one day after I accepted it, I met the chief legal counsel who said to me, I'm so happy you took the scholarship because you would have been wasted in teaching. And I said, wasted in teaching? No, no, no. And I went back and refused it and uh, continued uh, with working with education. And I've worked across every level. There's nobody in Jamaica who has worked across more levels than I have, you know, tertiary, primary, secondary, uh, television teaching, working at CPTC and those kinds of places. Uh, very early, long before we went virtual at church, I used to work at UWI, beaming programs across the Caribbean. So I've been, you know, seen it all. That is amazing. And enjoyed it, just the same. Amazing. Yes. Um how do you stay motivated considering the challenges facing today's teachers? Wow, Kayla, uh, one has got to dig deep and one has got to have a firm belief in God and to know that God is there for you and will guide you and even protect you because it can get dicey in, in some parts. But also the love of, the, of transmitting of reaching someone, of seeing someone see the light. That, that keeps you highly motivated. Yes. Thank God for the love of teaching. Yes. Uh, you know, Kayla, I work mostly now with corporate entities. You know, having retired from government teaching, I work across many corporate entities. And so it's not as challenging, perhaps, as if I were not in that area. Yes. Great. What advice would you give to teachers facing the same challenges in today's world? Right. Teachers, I would say that know who you are. Have a confidence in yourself. Know your subject matter. One of the critical things about having that confidence, if you know what you're about and you know that you know, it gives you a confidence. And so I say to persons, learn your content area. Know it. You see, your brother just spoke about two persons have already said that if you know the subject well, you must know it so deep that you can even correct the teacher. And if you can pass that on teachers, that is a guiding light and that will help you under God to do well. Thank you so much, Sister Henry, for sharing with us this evening. Thank you so much, Kayla. I'm so delighted to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we like to close this section of the program before heading into the award section with Proverbs 2, verses 2 to 6. So that thou incline thine ear to wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lift up thy voice to understanding, thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasure, and then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Thank you.
Okay. This is an extension of the program, Saints. But please bear with me. I am pregnant right here now. My heart, I feel joy within the sanctuary of my soul. For two reasons. One, of all the persons who were either interviewed or testified, I think it's only one that has not passed through my hands. And two, and two, is the first in two years that I'm getting the privilege to look in your eyes. And that gets me a little excited, you know? Gives me unspeakable joy and utterable delight. But we are flowing straight in the program. Please help me welcome in a special way, Brother David Findlay and his, bro and his brethren, Emil. He's a good brother, blessed with one of the most fertile minds ever to develop in a human cranium. He passed through an experience, but he's here, and he will be given an award. And also, the two persons to be awarded are Dr. Sister Millicent Phipps and Brother David Finley. Could we just, could you just bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we have come to the final phase of this program. Keep us focused, help us to be attentive, and guide us through, and may everything that is said and done in this phase be done to your names and glory. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Okay, we are going to be having the overview, Outstanding Educator Award, the Rational Criteria, that type of thing, Dr. Lincoln Phipps. Yes, the Outstanding Educator Award is the Andrews Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church Education Department Outstanding Educator Award. This award provides an opportunity for the church to recognize our educators, persons who have served the field for a number of years and who have done extremely well in impacting the minds of people and we have heard from Sister Henry at all levels, basic school, the primary level, the secondary level, tertiary, and beyond. So we are now recognizing those educators among us. And we have been doing this for a number of years now, and we have quite a number of educators in our church that we have recognized. Um, last year we did um, Brother Wint and uh, Sister Henry, and previously, we did um, Brother Reed and uh, Sister White, and you remember we have done others before, um, Sister uh, White, and we have done um, Sister Stubbs, Carol Myers, and um, a host of others. So we are recognizing these people because of what they have done. Now, the criteria, we recognize that it is very difficult to, to say to somebody, you are an outstanding educator unless we have established clear, clear criteria. And so we look, first of all, at your membership. You must be a member of this church. This is our church recognizing our members. So you must be a member or you must be attending regularly for about 10 years. That's your first criteria. The second one is that you must be in education at any level, whether you are uh, um, impacting the minds of educators or you are facilitating, you are organizing, you are managing an institution, but you must be involved in education. It must be your career. So it can't be a person who simply uh, does some teaching sometimes. No, that is not a, the person you're looking at. You must be somebody who has consistently been engaging the minds of people at any level. So that is the, the criteria we looked at. First of all, the, your, your um, involvement with the church. We looked also at your impact in education for about uh, 15 years. We've also looked at your outstanding contribution to education. So you can't just be teaching and not making any, any impact. And you yourself cannot say that I am impacting. No, 
others must be able to say, you have impacted. And so when we look at your CV, we, you would have seen we are persons who would have been recognizing you for your outstanding contribution to education. And lastly, we look at your involvement in this church. We must see where you have impacted the church through your involvement in respective departments. And so those are the criteria that we use to identify our outstanding educator. Now, we have also moved beyond what we have been doing. As Professor, um, Dr. Oliphant this morning spoke to, about, to us about changing your paradigm. And this year, what we have done, we have enabled our members to identify, to nominate these outstanding educators. So we did not sit down in a corner and say, let us identify these persons ourselves as the education committee. What we did, we asked you to partner with us to identify these persons who you have recognized as outstanding. And so the names presented this evening are the persons that you nominated. And so we are very happy that you have engaged us. So we went the, to the, using the online platform, we created a online application form with the criteria and we allowed you and to make your nominations. And based on that, we have identified two nominees this year who will be awarded as the outstanding male and female educators 2022. Thank you very much. Okay. The first one is Millicent Ruth Phipps. Tribute to Millicent Ruth Phipps, educator. I wasn't born to just teach. I was born to inspire others, to change people and never give up, even when faced with challenges that seemed impossible. Mrs. Millicent Phipps' career objectives have been designed to offer leadership built on collaboration to achieve organizational goals, thereby contributing to national development. This combined with her academic and community involvement have enabled her to influence a wide cross-section of society. Her career in teaching began after completing studies at Excelsior Community College and Michael Teachers College. She later obtained a diploma in Bachelor of Education and Bachelor of Education degree in teaching technical vocational education from the College of Arts, Science and Technology, which was later renamed the University of Technology. In her pursuit for excellence, Mrs. Phipps returned to Michael Teachers College, where she obtained a post-diploma certificate in administration and management. In 2016, she obtained the Master of Arts degree in Education Administration from the Northern Caribbean University. And in 2018, she initiated studies at the National College for Educational Leadership pursuant to obtaining professional certification for principalship. Her professional work experiences are varied and far reaching. Between 1986 and 87, Morant Bay High School was blessed with her pedagogical knowledge in secretarial studies. Her enduring love for teaching continued at Papine High School, where from 1987 to present, she has been molding the lives of young people and providing guidance and leadership to parents and all categories of staff from the wider school community. Her roles and functions at Papine are varied, serving as acting grade coordinator and head of both the science and business education and information technology departments simultaneously. Mrs. Phipps has discharged other responsibilities, including coordinator of the school's prefect body, a position she held for 33 years and a half, 33 years and as a staff member for student counselors. Her coordinating presentation and organizing skills are, exhib are exhibited in all areas of the school's community and outreach programs. She organized and chaired students' training and leadership workshops. Her planning abilities were integral to the work of various committees, including graduation, school dedication, and staff development. 
For, nine, for grades 9 and 10, she worked as presenter and chairperson for numerous activities, including Christmas luncheon, Children's Day, Students' Orientation Program, along with many internal seminars and intervention programs aimed, aimed at improving students' performance and teaching methodologies. The consummate teacher, Mrs. Phipps, was also an external examiner for the Caribbean Secondary Examination Council, CSEC, for the electronic document preparation and management paper, and an in item writer for the Ministry of Education Student Assessment Unit for the CCSLC examination. No community is complete without a teacher. Mrs. Phipps is centrally involved in various community services activities, including presentations at school devotions, girls' days prize giving, student council meetings, weeks of prayer and spiritual emphasis weeks, at Papin and other institutions, namely Arden Preparatory School, Kingsway High School, Meadowbrook High School, Immaculate High School, St. George's College, the Women's Center, and the University Hospital of the West Indies Medical Social Workers. It is no secret that Mrs. Phipps is a committed and dedicated elder in the life of her Seventh-day Adventist faith community. She has served in numerous capacities, including assistant teacher in the junior Sabbath school, leader of the spiritual emphasis committee of the women's ministries department, assistant stewardship director, the street feeding program, a member of the ch church's prayer ministry, lay preacher, and in outreach to shut-ins, nursing home and hospitals. Additionally, at Andrews and several other SDA churches, including Washington Gardens, North Street, Constant Spring, Sandy Park, Macedonia, Freetown, Villmore, Banana Ground, and New Kingston, Mrs. Phipps has made numerous presentations at break prayer breakfasts, homecoming, and community guest days, family life weeks, women's day, prayer and fasting services. In her community, she has also pursued elders certification programs in 2018, 19, 21, and 2022. Mrs. Phipps has served many, has achieved many honors and awards, including the Lions Club Outstanding Teacher Award and the Dedicated Service to Education Award, Leadership Award and Appreciation for Contribution to Institution Award from the Papine High School. For several years, Mrs. Phipps has achieved pass rate of 100% in CSEC. In both office administration and electronic document preparation and management at Papine High School. Today, we recognize Mrs. Millicent Phipps as the 2022 female nominee, receiving the highest number of responses for the prestigious Andrews Memorial SDA Church Education Department. Outstanding Educator Award, we are delighted to recognize her as a stalwart in the field of education and for her outstanding contribution to education at the local and national levels. Education Department, Andrews Memorial Seventh day Adventist Church, May 7, 2022. The Education Department of the Andrews Memorial SDA Church recognizes Millicent Phipps for outstanding contribution to the field of education. 
May 7, 2022. It is my pleasure to present this award on behalf of the Andrews SDA Education Department and the Andrews Memorial SDA Church as a whole. Reading now of citation and award presentation for Brother David Finlay. Feminine flavor will be added, Sister Feeling Lawson. A tribute to Mr. David Anthony Finley, educator. If it is true, as W. Allen Wallace has asserted, that, and I quote, statistics is a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty, end of quote, then it is hardly surprising that in a world in which uncertainty is pervasive, the work of the statistician has attained much, such immense importance in so many fields. David Anthony Finley is an accomplished statistician who has made an extraordinary contribution in the field of education. His tertiary edu education began at the University of the West Indies, from which he graduated with a BSc in mathematics in 1985. He pursued further studies at the University of Florida, graduating with a Master of Statistics degree in 2003. Mr. Finley began his involvement in teaching in 1984 at Calabar High School as an instructor in mathematics, including the subject Further Mathematics and Statistics. Having made his mark at Calabar for three years, he moved to the University of Technology in September 1987, where he has been a lecturer in a variety of statistical modules up to the present time. During the period of his engagement, he also served as a teaching assistant in statistics at University of Florida while he pursued his postgraduate studies in statistics at that institution. Mr. Finley has performed a number of leadership roles in statistic education at the University of Technology, including head of the Statistics and Research Methodology Division, August 2014 to January 2015, course of study developer for the BSc program in Applied Statistics, 2005 to 2008, the program director for the BSc in Applied Statistics, 2008 to 2011. The program leader in the certificate program in Social and Economic Statistics, 2003 to 2005. And the coordinator of the Capstone Project, 2017 to 2020. As a lecturer at UTEC, Mr. Finlay, has taught on a wide variety of courses in statistics and mathematics, including analysis of 
categorical data, environmental statistics, advanced biostatistics, ecology, statistical methods, engineering statistics, linear algebra, operations research and numerical analysis. Further, his professional experience has included the supervision of undergraduate research projects and serving as statistical advisor and consultant for various research students at UTEC. During the period 1991 to 1995, Mr. Finley also served as lecturer in mathematics and statistics, as well as advisor in statistics for final year research project at Northern Caribbean University. In 2020, Mr. Finney was involved in the planning and execution of a short course for the training of staff of the National Statistics Office and put on jointly by the International American Development Bank, CARICOM, and the, CAR the School of Mathematics and Statistics at, of UTEC. On this program, he wrote and taught the module on gender statistics, which was very well received by participants from eight Caribbean countries. In addition to his lecture room engagements, Mr. Finley was the founding president of the Jamaica Statistical Society, which he led from 2013 to 2016. He, ha he has conducted workshops in the, this society in statistical methods and in the R statistical software. Mr. Finley brings his discipline and love to research to social and religious matters. A devout Seventh-day Adventist Christian, he is a dedicated and committed servant of God and a member of, U and a member, sorry, of Unit 120 of the Andrews Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church. He particip participates actively in the weekly review of Sabbath school lessons and his contributions are always articulate and cogent. Where doctrinal issues arise, Mr. Finley applies his highly developed research skills to a consideration of the subject and pursues until he arrives at what he is satisfied is ultimate truth. He then shares the result of his research with supporting documentation and references in his desire to engage and convince his class members and colleagues. We are very pleased to recognize Mr. David Finley as a nominee of the, for the Outstanding Educator Award of the Andrews Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church Education Department. We are delighted to honor him as a time, tireless and a highly effective educator with an indefatigable seeker of for truth in a world of uncertainty. Brother Finlay, it is a pleasure of the education department of the Andrews Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church to recognize you today as for your outstanding contribution in the field of education and to award you with the Educator of the Year Award for 2022. We are pleased. So brethren, I think we should pay, face it forward, Brother Finley, so that everyone can see the award itself and your friends can see the honor you have received today with god's help thank you thank you brethren If you observe, these are very humble people. They have labored beyond the comprehension of an earthly reward, but it is good that the church can show some appreciation to people of this caliber for their efforts. I observe 
the previous awardee. She's normally a very vivacious individual. She is friendly and sociable. She loves to touch, but she's not touches. You know, tactile reassurance. She's easy to handle, but she was almost overwhelmed. But yet a little while, we're going to have the prayer for these awardees from Sister Sandra Cunningham. And then after that, Elder Millicent Phipps will respond on behalf of the awardees. Good evening, everyone. Can I ask the awardees to come forward? Sorry that you had to go back, but please come forward as the rest of the congregation stands with you as I pray. Let us give them a, not, a big amen, brethren. The kind of citation that was read was very, very impressive. So many years of service and the dedication and commitment. Let us praise the Lord for these Christian leaders who are in Zion. And as they come, we are going to present them to the Lord. I'm going to present them to the Lord that he will continue to care and to watch over them and to keep them sweet as they age gracefully. I just want to remind you that godliness, godlikeness, dedication, committed, committed, commitment, and committed service is what you have given in the service of the church and your community to the world at large, our Jamaica world at large. Some of you have impacted people all over the world. And for this, we are very grateful. So let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening to give you praise. Thanks, thanksgiving and adoration for these, your two children, Sister Millicent and Brother, Brother Finley. Lord, they have labored long and hard in your vineyard. They have been committed servant leaders and servant of yours. I pray, Lord, as this honor and this, these accolades are showered on them today i pray heavenly father that they will long remember these things because they are humble serving people of god they will long remember all that was said and i hope the citations will be presented to them so that they will be able to see them and see what god has done through them Bless them, bless their families. Continue to provide for them. Pour out this storehouse of heaven, of heaven's blessing upon them. And Lord, may they continue to remain faithful, faithful and true to you first, and then to their fellow man. May they continue to be holding up the name of God in education and in its educational pursuit bless them again lord bless their families and take them to heavenly places to be with you when you shall come in your kingdom for they would have been called faithful 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 servant of god hear our prayers lord and continue to overshadow them with your love and to mellow them with your grace 
and your abundance of knowledge, that as they age gracefully, the knowledge will become even more mature. Bless and keep them and their families and the larger church families to which they serve. May they continue to minister to their community and to Jamaica and the other territories, ter ter territories for which they have served. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for the victories that they have won. And now, Lord, do not let them depart from your presence without your holy anointing and your continued blessing. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Mr. Finley and I would like to thank God for health, strength, and for this outstanding award. As a matter of fact, I want to inject here, Mr. Finley, you were my math teacher at CAST, and I thank you for what you did. And I also want to say, Sister Henry was my language teacher at college, and I bless God for them. We want to thank the church through the education department for this outstanding teacher award this afternoon. And so I'm going to ask us to put our hands together as a round of applause to the church through the education department. We want to thank you for recognizing our work and worth. We are indeed blessed this afternoon. We want to thank you for those you have already recognized. And we want to say to others of us who are educators, to continue to offer excellence in your craft. Teaching has become a very challenging job these days. And we recognize also that our children, for most part, are not interested in learning. And it's a sad state of affairs. But we continue. We continue to offer of our best. We continue to allow God to guide, to give us revelation of what we need to do each day, to protect, and to instruct us as the master teacher. We want to say to our children, children, education is very important, not only for this life, not only for this world, but for the world to come. So I say to our children, our teens, our young adults, education is important. Please pay particular attention. God expects us to be educated. Hence, he had placed the first family in the Garden of Eden to learn. And he taught them himself. So it's important to learn and to get a good education. So we thank you so much for this award, and we thank you that the, you'll continue to grow from strength to strength, and that the church and its members will continue to make contribution to nation building and to the building up of the kingdom of Almighty God. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. So this is the end of Education Week. The theme... Yes, the theme, Christian education enabling future generation. This was our theme, but it is also, it is also the mandate of the department 
We have always embraced our future generation. And so you see, for example, the experience from Nikain Bent earlier, who has now started UTEC, pursuing his training as an architect. We were happy to have been able to provide us the, the, the scholarship last year to support this education. And we will continue. This, is, in fact, is one of the uh, mandates of the department. We continue to provide scholarship every year to our young people who are in need of financial support and who are pursuing tertiary education, even to non-Adventist institution. And so we do our Father's Day brunch. The brunch is uh, the vehicle that is going to help us to support our young people as they pursue their career through these tertiary institutions. We are also working with the um, Augustown Basic School because we believe that those young people are our future and they are in need. And so we continue to embrace our future generation through Adventist education. And so I want to thank uh, all the various individuals and departments, the music department, the um, communications department, our singers, and all the various persons who did all the many things that they were asked to support our education week. Certainly we want to thank Pastors Jump, Noel Jump who spoke to us on Wednesday, and uh, Pastor Omar Oliphant who took us through two services this morning. Truly, it has been a blessing. God has continued to be good to us. And so we give him thanks as he enables us to do what we have been called to do, to go. And so I thank you. I just want to ask Brother Finley, what is our statistics software? And certainly I'll be able to speak with him afterwards to find out and just to acknowledge his presence here because I know it would have been a challenge for his brother to get him here, but you made it time. Emil, and so I have appreciate and recognize you for your effort in supporting us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. My brothers and my sister, do have a good afternoon. And as we close our education day, we pause a little while to have our vespers. So we'll stand and make use of the hymn 652, as Sister Maisie prepares to come. 652, love at home. Let us stand. There is beauty all around when there's love at home. There is joy in every sound when there's love at home. Peace and plenty here abide, oil in fear on every side. Time that softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home love at home love at home time got softly sweetly glide when there's love at home i leave heaven smiles above when there's love at home, all the earth is filled with love. When there's love at home, sweeter sings the heralded by, brighter beam the azure sky. Oh, there's one who smiles on I. When there's love at home. Love at home, love at home, time that softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home. You may be seated. We'll leave the last verse until Sister Maisie has ended. Thank you, Sister Blake. Andrews. We have had a full week of looking at education at church and in our communities, indeed, in our country. 
we have had several sub-themes. This evening, I was delighted to hear the theme, Life is Beautiful with Education. This evening, my sub-theme is Loving Our Children Through Christian Education in the Context of Brain Development. The scripture lesson that the scripture passage that I'm going to look on is one verse, a very important verse, Proverbs 22, verse 6. We all know it. Can we say it together? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Before I continue, I want to say, Welcome to the month of May. This is a very important month, Sister Millicent. Yes, we have Child's Month. Month of May is Child's Month. In May, we have Education Week. On Wednesday, we celebrated our teachers. It was Teacher's Day. And I learned today that starting tomorrow, will be Children's Day right here at Andrews. Also, today and tomorrow, we are celebrating our mothers. Now we see why the month of May is important. There are also some other important dates in May, but I won't get into those. Now, back to my theme. Loving our children, looking at brain development. Healthy brain development during the early childhood period is building the foundation for leadership. Where we are developing leaders for our church and for our country from before the child is born. And very importantly, during the early childhood period. We know that Jesus is the master teacher. And we also know as Christians that he has admonished parents to be the next teacher, the best teacher on earth. And I say parents, so I should be saying teachers. And you don't have to be the biological parent, it could be the auntie, the uncle, the grandmothers. So I will say teachers slash caregivers. Your role is very important <clears throat> in developing the child. So I want you to know that parents have the most important influence on child's development in the early years. Parents and caregivers do with their children, what they do with their children in the early years is critical to physical and mental development. It is also important to the child's ability to relate to others as the child grows. And we call this social interaction, it could be emotional intelligence, but we know the relationship is important. Relationship, mother or child and parents, child and siblings, child in the community, child and the church members, all those relationships are important. And we all have a role to play. When I listened to Cherie this evening, and the other persons who were interviewed, but I have to say Cherie, I know Cherie from she was a baby. And I know that what she has become is as a result of the interactions she had with her parents. She told us, and we can believe her, and we have seen the result. So what is really fascinating about the brain development and for us to learn about that is to know what we can do. 
for the child to develop, the brain to develop properly, we need proper nutrition, we need nurturing, we need interactions. And I'm telling you that this will create the foundation for later interactions and later development. Now, according to Dr. Bruce, sorry, yes, Bruce Perry at Baylor College in the US, he's a child development professor. He says, the brain is different from any other organ in the body. Can anybody tell me why this is so? All right, you don't want to talk? The brain is the only organ that is not fully developed at birth. The heart is fully developed. Most of us are born with 10 fingers that are fully developed. They may grow bigger as we get older. However, the brain is not fully developed. The development of the brain depends on the interaction we have with the child. And the five senses are important. So when we touch a child, when we hug a child, that is telling the child from baby that we love that child. Each new taste, new smell, seeing a color, the colors of the flowers, the red, the yellow, the green, those interactions form new connections in the brain. And it is said that the connections in the brain are similar to the electrical wiring of a house. All those connections crisscrossing and going different places, that is how the interactions affect the brain in a positive way. It is also said that negative interactions with the children can cause some of the connections to be lost and they may never grow back. But good thing, the good news is we can make corrections and we can make up for it, but it's better not to have to make up if we start the right thing and keep on the right path. So it says the quality of parental interaction with their children in the first few years has an important impact on the connections. And we know that research is telling us a lot about that. If we shout at children, what do you think happens to that child? Have we ever seen a child being shouted at constantly day in, day out? Is that child looking forward to speak to that parent or that guardian when the, that person comes in the room? No, they, they shudder. And I am getting the wrapping up signal. <clears throat> anyway, I know time is going, but I'm just going to tell you a story. One young lady told me she's not an adult. She's married and she has children. She told me that when she was a child going to primary school, her mother used to shout at her so much that one day she was blinded. She could not see anything for a few minutes. And that's because her mother shouted at her constantly. And she also said, know that she's a mother. She finds herself shouting at her children. But then she remembers what happened when she was a little child. And so she tries not to shout on her mother. I wanted to look at the poem that says, I'm not going to look at it totally, but the poem that says, Children learn what they live. We know this poem, right? Children learn what they live. Some people say they live what they learn, but that's the reverse. Because the, the brain not fully developed and they're born like sponges, ready to absorb everything. When they live these experiences, they learn it. And later, they will live it. But initially, it is they learn what they live. So if we want to have happy children, we need to have happy environment, right? 
I am not going to look at the negative side. I'm just going to look at the positive ones. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with sharing, they learn generosity. If children live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with justice, they learn, sorry, if they live with fairness, they learn justice. If children live with kindness and consideration, they learn respect. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and with those around them. If children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place in which to live. Do we want our children to learn that our home and our environment is a nice and friendly place in which to live? Is that what we want? Yes. I want us to love our children, love one child at a time, and that way we are going to love the children at home, we love the children at church, we love the children in the community, and we will love the children in our country. And I'm telling you, we will have a better Jamaica. Sister Dom will pray for us. Are we going to sing the last? She'll sing the last chorus um, first, and then Sister Dom will pray. Let us stand. Jesus, make me holy thine, then there's love at home. May thy sacrifice be mine, then there's love at home. Safely from all harm I'll rest with no... Hail thy comforty bless, then there's love at home. At home, love at home. The will softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home. Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And even so, dear Father, even as we have spent this wonderful time with you on your Sabbath day, we ask, dear Lord, that you will help us never to forget that you are the true educator. And it is your desire, dear Lord, that we be drawn closer to clo and closer to you so that your Holy Spirit can transform us into your likeness. So keep us faithful during this week and help us never to forget this Sabbath when we learned so much from your people who you have called to be educators. So thank you and we praise your name and we thank you especially for the sacrifice that your son Jesus did on the cross on our behalf. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Savior, breathe an evening's blessing. Here repose our spirit singing. Sin and want we come confessing. Thou canst save and thou canst heal.